I'm going to talk about some of the current government initiatives. And the first thing I would say is, you know, the government's very clear. FGM is a crime and it is child abuse. Now, that might seem a <coughs> obvious statement to say, but I have to tell you, at the beginning of this parliament, actually just saying that publicly was regarded as somewhat controversial. Um, the establishing the idea that FGM was a form of child abuse was not universally accepted. You know, a few, four and a half years ago, we had no statistics about what was happening in the NHS. With very little public discussion in the previous five years of the previous <coughs> parliament, FGM had been mentioned as some total of ten times. Um, the 2013 NSPCC um, uh, survey of teachers found that six of te most teachers didn't know what to do, hadn't heard of it and didn't know what to do if it, they came across it. And a sixth of teachers said they wouldn't report it even knowing it was a crime because they were particularly <coughs> worried about the cultural sensitivities. So that was a very useful survey to have. And I say all that to just paint how different I hope you'll feel the landscape is, but also how critical your role is in now taking things from the policy making into the practical application of these things. Much good work is taking place across uh, a lot of different departments, as I say, working very closely with campaigners, community groups, and a lot of dedicated professionals. And, you know, our key aims are protecting girls, supporting families, preventing crime, and strengthening the affected communities so that they can continue the work that we already see happening on the ground um, to reject FGM and to uh, strengthen the resolve of those who wish to end the practice in their family. First of all, I just want to talk about what's happening uh, in the health world and in the NHS and I'll you about the progress there. I mean, as I say, the, from the point of view of the NHS and health professionals, I think, I think we're all very clear that the, role, the key role is prevention. I mean, there's much talk about prosecutions and I've always said that they have their place and if a crime is committed then the rules are followed. But for every, every prosecution is a girl we didn't protect. So it's really important that as much as anything, we focus our um, efforts on prevention. However, there is also some important work around data that I think in particular uh, feeds into other frontline services. The police have for many, many years been shackled by the lack of good available data to them to help them do their job, and I think we're beginning to tackle that. Um, so prevention, uh, caring, support, those are the focus of the health um, sort of uh, perspective. In April, we launched the National FGM Prevention Programme in partnership with NHS England, and that's uh, looking at ways the NHS can improve uh, the way that they tackle it. So for the first time, we're collecting data on FGM prevalence based on individual patient information. We have the statistical projections, but we didn't have patient data before. And it means that now all NH staff are formally required to write in a patient's record that a woman or girl has FGM when it's identified. Um, the na that's nationally collected data returned to the Department of Health by acute trusts each month. And we published the first data, which was September's data, in October of this year. 125 of 160 trusts reported. They reported that there were 1,200 active cases across their trusts of FGM, and 467 new cases, of which half were in London. Now, when we take that together with the Home Office's FGM prevalence study, this really is an absolute landmark, very much a milestone along the journey of ending FGM, uh, because we've got for the first time, I and mean, literally for the first time, we have a full picture of what is happening, uh, and we can begin to understand the scale of the issue within England. And without data, we are absolutely shackled in terms of our ability to commission services. As any of you know, when you're making a bid for a new service or you're trying to uh, make the case to expand the piece of work that you're working on, the critical thing that you use to make that case is data. So without data, we were really uh, in a bad place. Uh, and we weren't able to target the right services to the areas they're most needed. And it's a critical part of bringing FGM out of the shadows. Um, you know, that's much of the kind of last four years is about being gradually bringing FGM into the light and data is absolutely critical in terms of shining a very bright light on it. It also has a vital purpose in the cross-government fight and I mentioned the fact that many agencies, particularly the police and the prosecutors, have been extremely shackled by the lack of data. We're obviously not sharing detailed patient data at individual level, but we're sharing anonymised data with the government agencies. So, for example, you know, if you, um, you know, if you were sort of someone who was trying to make the case that you needed to have a particular uh, educational focus or a particular police focus in an area, knowing that your local acute trust has reported X number of women uh, through maternity as reporting with FGM, very clearly makes the case that this is a 
uh, a case for your area to be working in a multi-agency way. And that is the way we're most effective. Not working in silo, but working together to identify where it's happening to safeguard girls. And I have to say, you know, my experience to date has been of really good multi-agency working, uh, and we're very keen to keep that going. The next phase of the health work that's underway in my department is going to be to introduce the enhanced FGM data set. That will begin in April 2015 and we'll be collecting more information, richer information, for example about patients' countries of origin and how old the patient was when she was uh, cut. Now this is really important because patterns vary enormously, even within countries patterns vary enormously. And what we saw from the last UNICEF figures was uh, significant progress in some countries in terms of intergenerational drop-off of FGM, but also one of the things we want to track is, and you're going to hear about the different types of FGM, but we also want to try and track where um, people are shifting in terms of types of FGM practice, that's very important too. So that richer data set will help us monitor some of that, but it's really important to remember uh, when you're thinking about countries of prevalence that um, actually often it is more linked to a particular region or tribe and therefore uh, you might well see you know, girls who originated from Kenya for example some of whom will say their families have never ever been involved and some of whose families will have been practicing it for hundreds of years. Uh, so we have to be very sensitive to that and, and those nuances. We're going to collect also information right across the health sector and expand the remit to include GPs and mental health trusts. And I think we've only really begun to understand the extent to which we might need to provide services to girls who were, for example, mutilated in one country but growing up in a much more sexualised society like our own and the impact that has on them. The new NHS standard will also set additional requirements on how and when to share information between health professionals. So one example of this might be that when uh, one healthcare professional discharges a patient from hospital and writes to the GP, if the patient was identified as having FGM, that will be included in the discharge summary. So we try to make sure that people don't fall between the cracks in our system, that we keep a continuity of care there um, with a view to safeguarding, not just that individual, but in particular to because we know the family uh, mechanisms around FGM to make sure that we're safeguarding the whole family. As a side note, I would say one of the most exciting things happening, I was in a hospital last week talking to clinicians in one of the um, paediatric uh, clinics that's been set up, and what was particularly exciting that they reported was that whole families were coming in to see them. So far from sort of girls struggling to find someone to come in with them, uh, and having to be brought in, say, by a social worker. Girls were coming in not just with their mother, but with their grandmother and their aunties, and they were having whole family conversations about it. I took that as enormously heartening. And I have to say, you know, from a position where four years ago in my constituency I couldn't get some of the community groups most affected to even meet with me and engage on the issue, to see the level of change that's being driven from the community is enormously encouraging. The department, uh, my department's also commissioned Health Education England to produce five e-learning training sessions. They are free of charge to NHS staff and they're on the e-learning for health platform. We launched the first one of those uh, on the 6th of November, it's really good. Uh, it's been put together by some really experienced uh, professionals. And that deals with the issues posed by FGM at all stages of a girl or woman's life, looking at the impact on physical and emotional health, the legal status and the referral pathways. I can't recommend it more highly to any of you working in the NHS. Uh, we do want to uh, make sure that you have the tools to do your job. Um, an updated NHS Choices FGM website has also been launched and alongside that is a really good documentary for health professionals illustrating through conversations uh, how to broach and ask questions about uh, this sensitive issue. Uh, and again, I do recommend you have a look at that. It's extremely helpful. And that's been very much put together involving people who've actually been through this process and, and know what we're talking about. The FGM Prevention Programme will soon be publishing NHS advice to health professionals on how to implement safeguarding models, which take into account what actions to take from birth onwards. And so the NHS staff know exactly what action to take whenever they're faced with an FGM safeguarding concern. We're very, very well aware that busy frontline professionals need clear advice um, that is applicable in a wide range of settings. No one has time to go and read 80 pages of guidance if you're in an A&E uh, or whatever, or if you're in a busy maternity unit. So we're trying to make sure we can 
cut through that and make sure that is straightforward. We'll also be publishing advice on commissioning healthcare services, which will look at what a good <coughs> FGM health service looks like, and again, with examples of patient pathways. After we've delivered the training packages, the data reports, and those frameworks, uh, which advise healthcare professionals, we're going to be running a series of conferences around England in the spring. And that will focus on how to implement change locally in the NHS and how to provide sustainable FGM services. Those conferences will be free to attend. We'll be publishing the dates very shortly. Uh, I want those who attend both this conference today and any future conferences to really act as change champions, whatever your professional field, and to make sure that in your local service provision, you're, you're shouting about FGM, making sure that you're giving a lead on this, uh, that it is known and understood. It's never, ever back in the too difficult pile again. Uh, we will be promoting those events through NHS networks, uh, but we'll also be using our fantastic community of campaigners and experts to get the word out. So I know many of you follow people in this room on Twitter, and we'll be making sure that we get out links to all of those events so you can access them. Let me just touch uh, briefly on what's happening across a range of other government departments uh, to try and give you a sense of uh, joined up government action on this. The Home Office have issued a public consultation just last Friday on how to introduce a duty on all professionals to report FGM. Alerting the police to actual case of FGM will allow them to investigate the facts of each case. And you know, I say I've seen the police go on a journey just as we all have over the last few years. And you know, they do uh, particularly lack for data about on which to investigate. So it is important, um, and they need to increase the number of perpetrators, applicants. As I say, ultimately, prosecutors <coughs> mean we didn't protect girls, but they do send an important signal that the law is not to be disregarded and that the law will be upheld. Um, I would urge you all to share your views and respond to the consultation. It's quite a tight one. It closes on the 12th of January, uh, so please do take the opportunity, perhaps if um, there is any downtime over Christmas, uh, perhaps you can take a moment out to think about that and to formulate your response and get that in. It's very relevant to many of you in this room, having looked at all the different disciplines that you come from, uh, not just health, I mean education, everything. So it's important your voices are heard, because it is a genuine engagement on the issue.